Here's David Zinman conducting uh, J.C. Bach's Symphony in G Minor. And that is one of the works that will be performed this weekend with the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra. January 16th and January 17th, they're doing music of uh, Mozart and Haydn and Corelli as well. And the guest conductor with the WSO this weekend is Jean Lamont. She doesn't need a lot of introduction, but uh, she was director of Tafel Music from 1981 to 2014. 33 years, just last year, she uh, changed her role. And she's been praised by critics in Europe and North America for her strong musical leadership. She has also won numerous awards with Tafel Music, including being appointed a member of the Order of Canada. She has two honorary doctorates, one from York University and one from Mount St. Vincent. And the other thing is she's very passionate about teaching young professionals, which she does at the University of Toronto. And Jean Lamont just last year stepped down as music director of Tafel Music and is currently serving as the chief artistic advisor until the new music director is chosen. And Jean is in the studio with me right now. Good morning, Jean. Good morning. Pleasure to have you here. <clears throat> it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. And uh, we realized we had met each other very briefly about a year ago when you were in town for the Juno Awards last yes. year. Yes. And uh, you were on the red carpet as you walked off. I said, Jean, Jean. And it's like, you were looking around and who's that? And I introduced <coughs> myself. And so that was the first time we met. And yes, I'm and glad. I remember, yeah. I, I remember saying, I'd love to have you in the studio next time you're in town. And I'm so glad it worked out. Yes, it worked out. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. So in a few minutes, we'll talk about. Uh, the program happening with the uh, Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra. Of course, yeah. we don't want to forget about that. That's why you're here in town. But I wanted to... Now, you spent 33 years with Tafel Music. That's yes. a good chunk of your musical career, not all of your musical career. Um, let's just spend just a couple minutes just briefly um, telling people how you uh, came involved with Tafel Music. Oh, that's so, so long ago. Um, Tafel Music was uh, is just slightly older than that number of years. It was... Um, it was founded in two years before I came, and uh, immediately it was founded with a great deal of vision by two people who are no longer with us, and I mean literally they have passed away. Um, Kenneth Solway and Susan Graves were the founders, um, and they played wind instruments, oboe and bassoon, and as they realized right away that if their goal and vision was to have a world-class Baroque orchestra, they were going to need a violinist or maybe a harpsichordist, but certainly not an oboist <laughs> to lead the orchestra. It doesn't work. Um, and a lot of Baroque music, as you probably know, is very string-based. So they, they looked around and um, auditioned a few people, including myself. So the first two years were kind of experimental, but they had this very clear goal to create a world-class Baroque orchestra in Toronto. And um, as you know, their goal came true. So long story short, I came both the first two years as, as a guest, I guess as being auditioned, and then I was offered the job. And I've been there ever since. So that's the long story made very short. <laughs> so what is it that continues to inspire you and uh, to draw you to Baroque music? I've always loved Baroque music. As a student, as a child, I thought it was the music that spoke to me the most. Um, I never had the passion for the big romantic repertoire or or the um, the ambition to stand in front of an orchestra and play a big romantic concerto, which is, of course, what, what you learn when you go to conservatory as a violinist. Um, so I, I've never had that, and I always wanted to, I knew chamber music of some kind was where I wanted to go with this. And, um, and when I discovered period performance, um, which was when I was studying in the Netherlands, actually, um, which is where kind of one of the places where it, it really took off, First, and this was now I'm speaking now in the 70s actually. Um, when I discovered it, it was like yes, it was a truth that was so immediately apparent that I knew that that's what I had to do, and I just never looked back. Mm -hmm. So it's always just been the music that moves me the most, and there's so much of it. We only ever hear really a little bit of it. And um, even now, there's only so much of it that's considered the canon, like what, what we hear on the radio, what we hear, what we listen to at home. But there's so much more. It's a very rich period in European history the, of, of music, for music and art, but especially for music. And I, I think that, uh, you know, different countries have different periods that they excel at more uh, at certain things. Um, I mean, we could go on about that forever. <laughs> but for example, the early 20th century was amazing in France for, for both music and and art. But I think, and, and also in Baroque times, but there are certain periods that are a little drier for political reasons often, but also just 
I don't know, something about zeitgeist. So anyway, Baroque times, Baroque music, Baroque everything really speaks to me. So when you're in- interpreting a work, say, by, uh, by J.C. Bach or Corelli, how, how in, in, your, in the way you do things, do you try to stay as close to the score as much as possible? Or do you, what, what, when, what do you bring to uh, a particular Baroque work when you try to interpret it? What a good question. Um, you start by, by looking at what the real score is. In other words, what did the composer write? You don't want to start from an edition that somebody has mucked around with and has changed and has added this and that. You want to start with what the composer wrote. But then we're, I'm applying all kinds of knowledge that I have about the style and what they would have done. And that would have only been a starting point for them. They would have, in the case of Corelli, there's a lot of ornamentation that I'll be doing in the concert. There'll be a lot of notes that I'll be playing that are not written on the page that would have been fully in keeping with what Corelli would have done himself. He was a violinist, of course, or or his students and, and so on. The style was that. But you have to start from what he wrote. If you start from some 20th century edition, then you're going to start, you don't know where you are. You don't know what's Corelli and what's, you know, Joe Schmo who did the edition. And, and so you don't know where to, so I, it's very important to start from the raw material that is original, but then you take off and you, uh, then, you then, then you can really actually be um, musical. You can actually uh, interpret. Do you start at the fun. root. You start at the root and then you can feel very free to take it from there. Um, there are a lot of conventions of the time. I mentioned the ornamentation in Corelli, but there are all kinds of things that would have been understood. What, like what dynamics actually mean in classical music. Most of this program is Haydn, Mozart, J.C. Bach are all classical composers, not really Baroque composers. Mm-hmm. Only Corelli is Baroque on this program. Um, they had certain understandings of what their dynamics meant that are different from what a modern player might immediately think. So once you know that, then you might approach it a little bit differently. So that's kind of, um, that's what it is. You have to know what they actually wrote and work from a good edition. And then, and then from there, it's just a question of applying a little bit of knowledge of how they thought about their music. And it sounds so simple. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's very simple. <laughs> so how has your, has your approach changed to Baroque music since when you first started playing it? Well, I think that certainly my knowledge has deepened over the, the years. And, um, I think I'm willing to take more risks now than I used to be, and I'm not sure what that is. I mean, I think th- that one of the problems with Baroque performance is that we're so used to CDs, and we're so used to everything being absolutely glossily, glossy and perfected, and, and just, you know. Mm-hmm. In fact, that's probably not what it sounded like, because people were improvising a lot. And so when you're improvising and adding ornaments, this is not for orchestral music, but for solo music. Um, you're going to make mistakes once in a while. You'll play a note that isn't really in the chord. Oops, that was the wrong note. But that would have happened, though they would have been much more um, experienced and much more able to do that well than we are because they were trained that way. But still, you know, you, you would have, there would have been a higher tolerance on the part of listeners for error. And now we have a zero tolerance for any kind of error. And that sort of scares us and it makes us want to be perfect and the need to the the desire to be perfect can sometimes get in our way musically, but so I'm trying to I've been fighting that for some years, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm trying to just feel like who cares. Um, it's more important to have that spontaneity in the performance than it is to be perfect, and it it takes courage because of our classical training where where which is just absolutely against that way of thinking. Let's have a uh, I'm in the studio with Jean Lamont. Uh, Tafel Music spent 33, 33 years with Tafel Music. She's now uh, she stepped down last year as the uh, music director, and she is now the chief artistic advisor. As she sort of uh, slowly makes her way uh, onto new things, I'm going to play something by Corelli right now, and then we'll come back with Jean Lamont. This is from the Concerto Grosso that you will hear if you attend the concert this weekend. This is Corelli's Concerto Grosso in B flat. Neville Mariner, 
Academy of St. Martin in the field, stepping out of their un- their usual territory and doing some Corelli, Concerto Grosso in B. And that's one of the pieces that uh, will be performed this weekend with the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra under the baton of Jean Lamont, who's in the studio with me right now. And Jean, last year, you uh, after 33 years, you sort of half moved on from Tafel Music. And I say half because uh, you're still associated with them. What keeps you busy now other than Tafel Music? Well, I've been uh, I've increased my teaching at the University of Toronto. I'm an adjunct professor now, and I have quite a few students and um, a lot of coaching there. So I'm enjoying teaching. Um, we also have Tafel Music has some artist training programs that I'm very involved with developing and hopefully expanding in the future. Um, I find that extremely important. Passing on. I guess I've gotten to a point in my life where I just want to pass on what I know to the young people, and there's so many talented young musicians out there, so it's really fun to be able to have a chance to work with them. So I've been doing a lot of that. Um, I have been guest directing, which I have done for years, but for example, the kind of thing I'm doing here in Winnipeg, and I always love meeting musicians in different communities and, and, and having discourse with them about music. Um, it's always fun, and so I haven't met yet this this afternoon I'll meet for the first time the uh, the players of the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra and I'm looking forward to that very much and uh, so I enjoy t- doing things like that and I do that on a regular basis throughout Canada I also have some hobbies that I'm interested to pursue which I haven't actually had time to do yet because I've been still as busy as ever um, I love painting and mm. I've and I've just discovered that in the last couple of years. I'm not great, but I do love doing it. I just love sitting. Time flies when I'm sitting there in front of a canvas, just struggling with how to make that tree look like a tree. And, and so <laughs> um, I'm really not good at it. And I do love it. And I want to have more time for reading and, and taking walks and having lunch with friends. But all of that hasn't quite happened yet. Mm-hmm. I'm still working quite quite steadily. Um, so, yes, life is, is very full and, and very exciting, and there's lots to do. Do you listen to music while you're painting? I do. So I do listen to music while I'm painting. Mm-hmm. Baroque? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. I listen to a lot of Chopin. Okay. Um, but I listen to all kinds of music, a lot of piano music, a lot of lute music. I some, tend ah. to listen to one instrument at, at a time as opposed to big orchestral pieces. That somehow doesn't do it for me. Um, when, you know, when I'm painting, I mean, there are moments for that, but then I have to stop painting and listen to the music. It's too overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking yeah. of music, why don't we talk about the program happening this weekend? Because uh, that's yes. sort of the main reason you're in town. Yeah, you've um, mentioned the baton. I'm not actually conducting. I'm mm-hmm. going to be playing from the violin, which mm-hmm. is the way, in fact, all Mozart symphonies, we don't, we're not doing a Mozart symphony, we're doing clarinet concerto, but just to say that Mozart symphonies and Haydn symphonies were not conducted in Mozart and Haydn's time. Mozart always led his symphonies from the first violin, um, and that was the norm also for Haydn symphonies. The first violinist would stand, typically, at his place um, and uh, lead, and that's what was done, and, and the musicians were used to that, and that's what we'll be doing this week, which in itself will be an experience that's unusual for the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra, and um, it's something I've done all my professional life. So I enjoy doing that, and I'm very comfortable with it. And um, it's very different f- for the orchestra from being conducted. It's just is a very different thing to have somebody that you're, you're playing with somebody who's playing instead of with somebody who's conducting. It's there's less translation. You just as a string player, you just watch the bow arm and you just do the same thing, and without thinking, it just automatically is much easier than translating a beat from a baton into something on your instrument. It's just a different experience, and as I say, it's authentic, and uh, so it's that's going to be fun. How different is it to conduct a whole symphony when you've got all those players as opposed to a baroque size orchestra? I don't think it makes very much difference how many players there are. I think what makes the difference is how many voices there are. You get to a certain point, for example, in Beethoven symphonies, where the wind parts, there are many independent wind parts, and you're dealing with a much more complex score. And lining up the complexity of those, especially wind parts, Um, but also the strings, everybody, is something that is very hard to do when you're just playing. Whereas in a Mozart or Haydn piece, there are fewer moving parts, as it were. And it doesn't matter whether you have six or ten first violins. It's one part. So that actually is, it's not 
it's the limit, I think. This repertoire is probably the limit of what is comfortable to do without a conductor. And there's a reason why there weren't professional conductors until Beethoven's time, because there wasn't a need for them. And there wasn't the tradition of having them because there wasn't really a need. I mean, it was born, the conductors were born out of the need to have somebody lead something so it doesn't fall apart. There wasn't that need for this repertoire. There was when the Beethoven symphonies came along. This is great. This is a history lesson for me right there, <laughs> there as go. well. Thank you. Um, what, what I want to do now is I've, I've chosen a piece from one of my favorite uh, early Tafel music CDs. This is uh -huh. an old CBC recording, and it features the music of Joseph Boulogne. It's a very colorful figure. Very, yes. uh, you know, I, I remember when it first came out and I heard it and I was just enraptured by the music yeah. and, his, and his story. So why don't you uh, introduce this, this piece that I'm going to play for you, the uh, Symphony in D. Okay, well, Joseph Boulogne, the, the, the um, Chevalier de Saint-Georges, he was also called, was a very um, interesting historic figure. And I think I mentioned earlier that there's a lot more music than we know about. We only seem to know about the few famous composers. Well, he was one of the ones that we discovered. It's really fun to discover these people. He was a, a, a black man. He lived in Paris. Um, his history is that his father was a aristocratic, French aristocrat, and he was in Guadeloupe. And he had a slave that he fell in love with and that he had a child with um, whose name was Nanon. And he brought Nanon and the baby and his legitimate wife and, and their daughter all back to France with him at one point. He got in trouble with the law. So he left France, uh, Guadeloupe and went back to France. And he brought up um, his son who was, I guess you could say half black, although I think that's not a politically correct term. But anyway, um, he brought him up as as an aristocratic French gentleman. And he was an amazing athlete as well as an amazing violinist. A fencer, correct? He was a fencer. Yeah. He was, yep, he was uh, one of the best fencers in Europe and one of the best violinists. And he had an, a, a remarkable career. In fact, he's the, the fellow who um, commissioned Haydn's Paris symphonies, which are a famous set of symphonies, for the orchestra that he was the, conduct, the uh, director mm. of. He was the one who stood up and directed the first performances of, of Haydn's Paris symphonies. Anyway, he wrote some music as well. And uh, the symphony in D major is also the overture to an opera he wrote called L'Amant Anonyme, so the anonymous lover. Um, and uh, he, I, I don't know if the whole opera still exists, but this overture to it, which is um, a three-part overture, which is we're calling a symphony, which is they, they did that all the time. They would write them so that they could be excerpted like that, um, is a very, very happy piece. But typically of Saint-Georges, this you think it's all very superficial for one moment, and then the next moment he tosses in something profoundly sad and very, very heart-wrenching. And um, so that you feel that, and you'll, you'll notice that in the slow movement, very with very simple means, he will absolutely just make you feel very sad for a moment so it's and then then he's back to the joyful stuff so he was a very remarkable historic figure thank you for that and thank you for coming in oh, my I've pleasure i've been uh, chatting with jean lamont she's in town this weekend to perform with the winnipeg symphony orchestra they're doing uh mozart corelli haydn and jc bach and she will be conducting from the violin place <laughs> as they did back in the day again pleasure to have you here and, thank you uh, have a wonderful weekend Thank you, and, I will. And uh, I'll be at the show Friday. Looking Great. forward to it. So here is music from an old uh, Tafel music recording, uh, Jean Lamont leading them, and Joseph Boulogne's Symphony in D.